With age comes wisdom, experience, and a whole lot of unexpected changes. Welcome to Dad Brain, where two best friends share their journeys through the ups and downs of their 30s. Get ready for the raw and honest realities of growing older. Here are your hosts, Matt K and Matt L. Welcome back to another episode of Dad Brain. We have a wonderful special guest with us today. Before we introduce our special guests, I want to let you know that if you are watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit that like button. You leave a nice little comment down there. Maybe we'll buy something off your baby registry for you. And you also hit that subscribe button. Social media, follow us at DadBrainPod on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Matt, I don't know if you've seen, I've been going through the TikToks a lot this week. My parenting cheat codes have really stirred the pot within the parenting community, and I continue to do so. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you are just listening to this podcast, leave a comment, a rate, review, all that stuff on whatever podcast platforms you listen to. Um, obviously, we have our co-host, Matt K, but our guest today is Rick Daniels, who mm -hmm. is a certified social worker. I have a master's degree in social work. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you. And mm -hmm. Rick and I go back. Mm -hmm. uh we have been friends man i can't even remember when we actually first met rick like i i would i would put it somewhere around middle school yeah so seventh looking grade. seventh grade mm -hmm. seneca middle school shout out to him uh go mm -hmm. what was our <laughs> what was our uh... jaguars there you go jaguars you know the jaguars yes and we mm -hmm. played football together and yeah, so we, we've known each other for a long time, and when we started this podcast, we wanted to interview dads, and you're going to be able to give us kind of that uh, more actual science background, because we're just making it up as we go over here at the Dad Brain Pod. I think we've done pretty well so far, but no, we just appreciate you being here today. Well, thank you. You know, you talk about science. It's one of those things where, you know, you have so much of this being a soft science and in, in that it's a lot of development, a lot of understanding. It's a lot of seeing communication patterns, understanding values, seeing how those things really kind of bleed over to um, th that parenting role, that dad role, and really understanding who you are as a dad so that you don't allow those things to really interfere with your ability to be the best dad that you are. You know, I mean, there are times where we want to be super involved. We want to be super engaged, but yet, you know, our minds are preoccupied in, in the way things should be or how things aren't at this time or um, just a lot of different things that kind of all come together that interfere with that ability just to be present. So, yeah, that's that's where I'm at, Rick, because I am the uh, proud papa of a 13 week old baby girl Ooh. and it's absolutely incredible but i'm also working from home full time and my wife is going back to work here very soon so just really trying to understand how i can really show up the best way possible is important to me that's a, a tough time too especially when they're so young and you're, you're trying to get that pattern of that sleep pattern and what are all these fussy noises they're making and at some point you start recognizing certain things you're like oh well that's that's a hungry cry that's the change me cry that's this that's that and you start to pick up on these things and it just kind of all hits in stride and you can kind of get going but you know getting to that point isn't exactly an easy point to be at because it's the the sleepless nights the hey i tried everything then all of a sudden something just works and it's like I'll remember that one. That one will be in my toolbox for sure. You know, but yeah, Matt, I'm, I'm, yeah, go ahead, man. So I, every episode we do it, you know, we hear all the positive stuff that mm -hmm. you're going through, uh, all the happy moments, the smiles after the poops, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Has there been any like stress, anxiety, something that's like brought out a little bit of an attitude in you that you take a step back and you're like, that's not me. I got to curb that right now. Because, I mean, this has to be the most stressful time. So you can't ask, you know, her, like, why she's crying or wh what's going on with her. Like, yeah. you you know, like, have you found, like, a little bit of an impatience coming out that you, you know, you have to work on? Or are you, I mean, your career has yeah. been with working with children for since you've been a teacher. So, I mean, you've got to have some right. built-in patience from that. But No, absolutely. I mean, that, that definitely did help a lot. Um, right now, it's more of... Being able to understand that 
the relationship that I have with my wife is just as important the relationship that I have with my daughter um, and really trying to prioritize that as well. But when you're talking about kind of those bad moments, it's those moments of resentment where, you know, I'm having to wake up to make a bottle instead of her having to wake up or, you know, um, uh, the best way I get around that, though, is I just cut out the assumptions, mm -hmm. right? I cut out the assumptions and I prioritize communicating. Um, so that keeps it to a minimum, but yeah, I mean, that is definitely a natural part of it because as a first time parent, you are learning as you go. Right. Um, and you know, my wife and I, we've only been married to, you know, going on four years, four years here. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're still learning a lot about ourselves and then you add another human being to the mix. Mm -hmm. You learn a lot more. <laughs> so I'm going to, um, say you're welcome then to you because it sounds like a lot of your impatience and struggle comes with, you know, sharing of the, the load and the responsibility, um, which, you know, that's something you've had to really work with um, before you had your child, you know, with me as your podcast partner, you know, <laughs> doing jack shit while you take do all the work with this thing. And, you know, I take half that credit. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're welcome for helping you with that. Um, but Rick, I, I do want to ask too then, you know, because I hinted, hinted uh, Matt's previous career as a teacher helping with that. Um, obviously, you know, you, you do this, you know, you went to college for a lot for like understanding mm -hmm. behaviors and therapy mm -hmm. and recognizing this kind of stuff. And you do it as a career, um, mm -hmm. having two boys and, you know, mm -hmm. going through all that. Did did that training kind of help you or, or is it the opposite is going through that helping you with your career? Mm -hmm. Oh well, yeah, and the interesting thing as a, as a clinician, you know, before you have kids, there's so many people that ask like, "How would you know this?" Like, you don't have kids. Like, how are you supposed to relate to me? Um, and the minute you have kids, like, I can remember my son was like maybe like a month old of that, and someone finally dropped that bomb on me. I'm like, "Yes, yes, I finally can say yeah," and they just totally dismissed it. Like, I was waiting so long for this to like just <laughs> drop. And I had that opportunity and then it was like, you know what, it just, it's like, it's just a way to dismiss you. And that was pretty much it. But yeah, you know, you have so much where that book smart, that book knowledge, that, that what's written inside all the text is all really important things. What you learn inside classrooms is important, but that ability to apply it is a whole different thing. You know, when you're sitting there and you're saying, okay, well, you know, this is how, you know, you go through and work with somebody kind of decompressing with stress and, um, trying to understand some of those triggers and some of those burdens that we have from society and beliefs about ourselves and everything too. And you get to the certain point where you're like, okay, well, it's great to have that textbook application, but to actually put it to practice is really hard, you know, and there's a lot of uh, dads out there that not only are they trying to put that into practice, but a lot of them didn't ask to be a dad kind of thing. Like we assume like a lot of people like absolutely like plan this out. Like, yeah, you know, somewhere around, I don't know, 17 and a half, I'm going to have my first kid. And it's like, well, you know, you never know. I mean, people don't, uh, we don't consider the experience of somebody else and how their life circumstances and how they see kind of their role that they're all of a sudden assigned to really does affect them. And, uh, but yeah, it's that, that clinical application compared to actually being a dad. And sometimes there is this crossroad. And you have to just step back sometimes and just allow yourself to just see things and see, okay, well, am I putting this on myself or um, is do I feel like someone else is putting this on me? You know, if you're reading through all these parenting books, trying to figure out who you are and how you make all these different things look, you can read a thousand different things. And often they'll say a thousand different things, you know, but you'll go and you'll find what works for you. And there's that old man wisdom where you look back sometime and, you know, years down the road, some young kid will run up to you, but like, I'm so stressed out. I don't know what to do. And you're like, hey, I listen to a dead brain. It's almost a dead podcast. It's getting there. That's our workout podcast. It's getting there. But yeah, um, yeah, I listen to that podcast and it helped me out kind of thing. But um, but yeah, it's, it's an application that's difficult, you know. But, you mentioned like, you know, you never think about it. Like a lot of parents may not have wanted to be parents or like mm -hmm. it wasn't their it wasn't a goal or something they worked towards and mm -hmm. not an hour ago, my wife and I were sitting like, how did she look at me? And she asked, she said, I never stopped to ask if, you know, you were okay with this. Like, you know, it's a little late, but if this, you know, was something you like were that you were comfortable with and you wanted to do and you, how you felt about it. And I looked at her, I'm like, mm -hmm. you, you must not know me very well. Cause I mean, I'm obviously cool with it. And you know, I, I don't mm -hmm. think like that, but I never thought about it too. And it kind of struck me. I was like, I didn't, like really think that there was another option either 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, you know, we wanted to become pregnant, but I never stopped to actually ask myself if it was really what I wanted, which it is, thankfully, because I had like 30 seconds before mm-hmm. I answered her to reflect back on it <laughs> and luckily i made the right answer but yeah that, it's just it's funny that you say that because literally out of nowhere my wife asked me that question today hmm. which yeah. you know since we're having our baby like november 19th it's <laughs> like i was like well where was this you know 10 months ago but <laughs> you never messed around during valentine's day that's hunting, hunting season man it's hunting season you don't mess around on valentine's day for that reason it hits in a bad yeah. time you know but Anyway, I know I'm, uh, it's, it's a huge term. I keep telling my wife, I'm like, you know, what's it going to be like being in that hospital alone while I'm hunting? <laughs> yeah, your ass. Yeah. Uh, one thing you said there, Rick, was we I, you said it's so much more professional and mm-hmm. doctory, but it was like just the, like it was boiling down the concept of empathy. Right. Mm-hmm. My wife suffers from anxiety. Um, Mm -hmm. and she has the constant fear of dying. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the concerns that I had that one of my other friends who is a organizational psychologist, he was like saying, like, aren't you afraid that your wife is going to project these anxieties on your child? And I was like, well, I guess I never really thought of that at all because Mm -hmm. I didn't think that was a thing. Um, and Mm -hmm. it's so hard for me to understand, like, just what it means to be anxious and like how she has to cope with that on a daily basis. And then you add the needs of another human being to that. And it's just a lot more of me like saying like, okay, I need to, I need to be more involved. I need to be doing more. I need to be asking more questions, seeing where I can help out. Um, there's not really a question there. I'm just more brain dumping. That was actually something, uh, sorry not to let you speak, Rick. I know you have a very poignant answer or, comment to that but um that was actually something that was brought up in that birthing class and it was probably the most important takeaway i got from it and again i'm going to reiterate birthing class for guys is useless you're going Mm -hmm. there for your wife um and to be supportive and that's exactly what you're talking about matt is you know with those anxieties you're not an anxious person so you're the the yin to the yang there but Mm -hmm. they talk about postpartum which a lot of that is anxiety and now that you know and being worried that nobody cares about you anymore because they only care about the baby because for you know nine months everybody just cares about you all the attention and spotlights on you and now it's on the baby and you're worried about being forgotten that's like the root cause of it and the only take really take my head from that class was you just have to be super supportive and not fall so deeply in love with your child that you forget that you have a wife mm-hmm. and that that was really the most important takeaway I got from that class. But anyway, I'll let right. our guest speak now. <laughs> and notice, as far as with anxiety, you know, when we're looking at anxiety, look at anxiety. Usually, wants some kind of a plan or some kind of understanding or some level of empathy. How you're saying, Matt, that ability to, you know, I can hear what you're saying and I, I can see kind of what's going on here. I can see in your body language. I can see just by what you're how you're presenting yourself that there's this level of distress that I can probably do something about. Um, a lot of guys, when we're thinking about the ways that anxiety sometimes is presented towards us, is presented in such a way where we're like, okay, well, this is totally illogical and irrational. Like, you know, when she comes running at you, you know, baby in her arms, all this stuff, yelling that you never do the dishes. And it's like, oh, I did the dishes yesterday. But I guarantee if you say I did the dishes yesterday, it's ooh, like that's going to be bad. But the idea is that she feels unsupported. She feels like she's kind of, um, she's not important at this time. She feels like you're, she's not really, you're not there for her. Maybe you know, you have all these different possible answers that would recognize an emotion. And if you don't see those things and you argue about the dishes, you are sleep, you're probably sleeping on the couch that night. I'm not going to lie; it's not going to go very well for you. But you know, um, yeah, it's uh trying to see how anxiety does present in each person you know you might notice certain things that um they play play out whether whether it's a you know, finger picking whether it's like almost like a rocking like a sensory kind of thing um or whatever it may be you'll recognize certain things and say hey i gotta i gotta maybe do something right now and i can tell she's distraught and by asking what's wrong like that might be a, a like the, just jump to a bit of a conclusion and see what happens you know can see that you're really overwhelmed. What can I do? How can I help you with this? You reasonably, any anxiety isn't um, unfounded by any means. There's usually some reasonable reason why it's there. Um, it's that ability to sit there and really just have a moment and 
bond and connect and try to figure out how I can be supportive as a, as a father and as a spouse, you know, but, um, what, what can you do as a parent to uh, this is probably, I don't know the answer to this, but like, what can you do as a parent to kind of not project that onto a child, right? Obviously we have a newborn, but like, like stoic. Yeah. Is there like anything that she can do or I can do to ensure that those anxieties don't go to that child or is it kind of already set in stone? I think one of the greatest things anyone can do is really to, to put that work in, you know, go. And this is once again, that this is not supposed to be medical advice. This, uh, is, this is a podcast. This is a support kind of a thing. And I have to say it, but, you know, go to a therapist, go sit down, talk through some of those anxieties, some of those things that you saw throughout childhood that really um, kind of sat wrong with you. If you had any near death experiences during childhood, you probably want to process through that at some point, because if not every single time that kid walks towards a road or jumps in a pool or does this or does that, like if you don't know what's happened to you or you're not aware of what's happened to you throughout your journey of life, and then all of a sudden you're given this child, every insecurity you might have might just like project onto this kid, how you're saying, you know, this idea like, you remember my father would be like, yeah, good old Neil, you know? I'd be walking out the door. He'd be like, hey, look both ways before crossing the street. And it's like, I'm 19 years old. Like, what are you talking about? Like, look both ways before, or like, hey, the gas pedal's on the right. You know, it's like, <laughs> brakes on the left. It's like, why are you telling me this? Like, this is co common sense. But obviously, he loved and cared about me. But the other side is that, hey, you know, in that worry, it came out in these reminders. And it actually created a lot of anger at the time. But then looking back, it's like, yeah, he really just cared. You know, that was the... That was the idea that he cared. He wanted to be there. He wanted to make sure that everything was all right. But uh, all in all, you know, it's one of those um, those moments where if you're not aware of how these things come out and how they project onto your child, that they will project. And it might not necessarily be the best outcome because there are kids that rebel against that. There are kids that push away. There are kids that think that their parents are super controlling because of it and they won't let them do anything. They're helicoptering all the time and won't let them go anywhere without being tracked or monitored or any of these things. And it's just a lot, you know, but <sighs> so one that, I mean, that's awesome. That whole, like look both ways when you're 19. And so like, I mean, to me that says it like not take it literally, but you know, slow down and, you know, think a little bit. So, you know, mm -hmm. sounds like yeah. you're going too fast, but, um, and you might be biased with this answer, but are, is therapy only for people that are, you know, having like really dire issues that, you know, um, or, I mean, is therapy a good thing? Cause not a lot of, you know, you don't, you hear about ph pharmacies recommending drugs for every little thing, you know, mm -hmm. people saying, go to the doctor for every little thing, but you never hear about people talking about like, if you feel well adjusted getting, you know, going to therapy, even like a physical, like a mental physical, um, mm -hmm. is that is in your professional opinion, is there any benefit to doing that, to seeking out therapy, even like once a year, even if you feel like everything's going fine? Right. I mean, maybe it's not, maybe you're, you're suppressing stuff. I don't know. Right. Well, yeah. And, the, the, and yes, there's that ability to go and to see a therapist and not necessarily need this, uh, a major depressive disorder or a uh, generalized anxiety or any of these pretty heavy things that, you know, people sometimes present with, or even PTSD or any of these things, you can have just the idea of an adjustment disorder. You know, adjustment disorder is you having a experience within the, the normal course of life that sometimes can be really just difficult. It causes anxiety, it causes depression, it causes sometimes some different stirring of emotions that you really don't know what to do. So therefore, if you can go and you can sit down with a therapist and they look like, I'm about to have a kid, like it's gonna be my first child. This is super overwhelming and I don't know what to do. And they're probably not gonna throw some major overall uh, diagnosis at you. They'll go ahead and let's say adjustment disorder and let's go ahead and talk through those, some things and see your anxieties. And we'll try to, you know, we'll try to get you to a point where you feel like you've made some progress and you kind of know what to do and how to manage some of these things. And most importantly, that you're preparing yourself for these changes and the, the communication, the conflict, everything that comes with it, you know, it's like, there's a lot there that, you know, you don't even think about that comes with parenting. Like, here you go, you're a new parent. Now here's all this anxiety and sleeplessness and difficulty finding time to eat or, you know, go to the bathroom or anything. It's like, how are you going to do this? And with guys, I feel like it's a little bit better. You know, this idea that we have this ability sometimes to step away. Baby often wants mom, you know, you realize how useless your nipples are, you know, when when you become a father, you know, it's like when they're rooting on you, you're like, these things are just useless. I've had them since third grade, but they're still here. You know, it's like oh, they're useless. Yeah. For mine. <laughs> put put um, the taxes on and see what happens. You never know. <laughs> so is 
therapy, um, the main benefit that people get, is it through just like talking it out or is it through different management techniques and, and guidance things that like you were talking about? Do you see which is do you see as like the most important benefit to therapy, like learning how to manage stuff outside of therapy or just laying it out to somebody that really has to have has like an unbiased opinion of you? Right. Well, I think the benefit of therapy is whatever you want, want it to be. If you're somebody that, you know, you've read a thousand books and you know how to cope and you know how to do deep breathing and stuff like that, like the, the coping strategies, a lot of them are out there. But having somebody that actually knows how to listen and is not going to judge you or criticize you or blame you or shame you or any of these things or turn it back on you and make you feel bad about the way that you're thinking, you know, it's having someone that can do that is really powerful. And very rarely do we have people in our lives that are willing to do that just because they're all invested somehow in us and they're also also invested in themselves too so they hear certain things and they might try to get away from a difficult conversation because they don't know what to do you know they're like okay well i don't know how to respond to that one so let me go ahead and talk about that experience that i had that's exactly the same but nothing like what you're actually talking about but they'll make it about them it's like oh gotcha you know but but yeah they're the idea of therapy, sometimes people just need that listening ear. Sometimes people want coping strategies. Every therapeutic perspective has kind of a little bit of a different outcome sometimes. Sometimes you're looking at those core beliefs about self. Sometimes you're processing through childhood. Um, really interesting right, one right now is IFS, actually internal family systems. And as far as with different parts of you and how each part kind of is within you and they, it has you thinking certain ways and interfering with your daily routine and all these different things so it allows you to step back but that is more of that self-reflection and self-awareness is kind of how your own um your own experience over life kind of shaped you as a person you know and how that's kind of um guided you towards certain responses and to get away from certain things maybe to use a bunch of substances and stuff like that you know all these different um ways to respond to conflict but anyway Dude, that's i mean you just kind of took like what i said which is kind of an idiot's way of talking about something for sure and the, i think hmm. you must be a great therapist because you just listened to exactly what i said repeated it back to me and also gave me a level of understanding that i've never had before so i mean you, you're definitely doing something right because that was amazing I, yeah. my mind's blown right now what one question that i had rick was um before we had our child we heard good things about couples therapy and there was no problems in our relationship or anything like that and we actually went to a couple therapist um we made it for one session um and my wife was out she was like she felt attacked because mm -hmm. they were only commenting on like everything with her and nothing with me um i mean they were asking basically like the same questions to me but all the like all of the support and the different strategies that they were giving were all geared towards her. So she felt very attacked. So like I kind of saw the benefit of it, not because they were in my corner, but because we were just getting these things out in the open. So like for someone that's in my position, what could I do as a partner to kind of like say, Hey, this is something that we should probably explore again, especially with a newborn. Right. And, I think what people think is that all therapists kind of have an understanding of how to work with individuals and couples and families and everything too. And when you see, and when you, if you take on that look and you think that every therapist can kind of work with every couple, um, it, it's not the truth. There are certain people that really specialize, marriage and family therapists specialize in, you know, couples and communication and everything too. Um, if you're seeking someone out for couples counseling, make sure that they have the credentialing to do couples counseling. Because if not, it might be a little bit of a biased look at certain things because there is an art to be able to understand what this person is saying and what that person is saying and not to take sides and be able to get people to kind of step back for a sec second and hear each other and try to figure out what's going on in that moment. Um, but there are a lot of therapists that will take it on and say, yeah, I have no problem working with couples. And it's just a train wreck from day one. It's like, you should not be doing this. Like, just know, like, why? <laughs> why did you say this was a good idea? Like... Yeah. make sure and there there are i mean we have ceus we have different universities that specialize in certain types of counseling and stuff like that too um but if you have somebody who is not being mindful of their area of practice or the way that they're practicing or how they're coming at people like that can be really overwhelming and it shuts down conversations and it shuts down opportunities so it's you know 
to revisit that, that idea of let's try someone else. Let's go ahead and find a therapist maybe for you to talk to. And then I'll come in for some couple sessions every once in a while if they're really trained in that and they know what to do. Um, so that she maybe is that kind of even that focus because I mean, I'll have people come in and I'll have one person as the main person in therapy and in counseling. And we'll invite the, the, the partner in just to kind of talk through different symptoms and things that could be better and things that could improve and make sure that they're being heard. But my overall priority is always that person who's who is my client. And then that person that's coming in is this, yes, it could be used as asset inside treatment to possibly kind of help things along or to understand things or see how certain comments being made can possibly interfere with the communication, the relationship. But all in all, you know, it's that ability to say, let's go ahead and, and try to bring people in and work towards things. But you're doing so in such a way that's um, just mindful of that, that how you practice and how you do certain things, if you are a therapist, that is. But um, anyway, I go off on these tangents and I apologize. It's... No, no, this, that, that's what a podcast is about. Mm -hmm. That's the meat and potatoes. That's the interesting thing. And mm -hmm. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's great to hear you say like, you know, you, once you seek out a therapist, you're not, you know, stuck with that person if, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that you have to be happy with what you're getting, mm -hmm. but definitely to be mindful if what you're getting is working or appropriate. Right. Um, so I think that's a great bit of information is, you know, it try things out um yeah. but kind of moving on i do want to ask you know this is dad brain we're here to talk to dads about dads and about being a dad so mm -hmm. you're a dad how old are your children um mm -hmm. was becoming a dad a goal for you was it like we kind of touched on earlier was it kind of a thing that happened and you were like you know i don't know if i want to be a dad and um you know let's mm -hmm. let's dig into that Right. I have a, a, a soon to be six year old in December and a four year old. So um, two boys, very rambunctious. I wanted to be a dad. Um, the, the story of kind of like how I found out I was a dad, like I, there was like the, so much excitement. It was like 630 in the morning. She comes running in with this positive test and she like throws it at me like a boomerang. I mean, it just like whizzes over my head. I'm just like, what is this? And she's so excited and I'm super excited and all this stuff. Then she goes off to work and I'm like in this room, like anxiety just hits all at the same time. Like, what have I signed up for? But it's been a journey. Like it's been something that I definitely wanted. Um, and it's been definitely eye opening and probably just one of the most challenging things because you don't really consider how like, I I'm shocked that I have kids. I can't believe I'm allowed to have children. Like, this is incredible, you know? It's like uh, that, that kid that used to make all these horrible decisions back in the day and has all these horrible stories that follows him. Uh, like, you know what? Um, I'm surprised I can have kids. It's good. But yeah, it's one of those things where it's like you're, you're batting a thousand, you know, at some point. And it's like, ooh. Like, the first one was more of a, a, a planning. The second one was like the, hey, we want to have a second. And like, let's just go ahead and kind of see where it takes you kind of thing. And that was a little bit more of a planned out, like, hey, by the way, we're having a second. And that was really cool too. Um, but different kind of feelings towards both. Because once you have one, you're like, okay, two couldn't be that bad. Um, but there are people that have an octomom situation, you know, like nine kids. And I don't know how they do it, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah. Sorry guys, I'm gonna go ahead and crack this polar ice. It's not it's not a beer by any means. It is a polar ice. I don't know if we can get a censor that one out, but. No, no, we're good. Anyway. Um... But... I think, board, man, I no board. Have similar situation we you know we wanted to be dads me i mean i think i a part of me always wanted to be a dad to you know i was never against being a dad it wasn't a huge priority and me wanting to be a dad i definitely had to wait till there was a, a point in my life where i was comfortable with going down that road because it's it's a long road and you know there's really no going back from it so, yeah. um, but yeah, I think we all are kind of on the same page with that. We, we obviously wanted to be, uh, parents. No, uh, I mean, I was, but, I was the exact same way, Matt, because for the longest time I was, I was a teacher and I didn't feel like I was financially suitable enough to be a father. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we went through all these different life changes, a massive move down to Florida, leaving family, like went mm -hmm. through a lot of stuff. And it was kind of like that one thing that was kind of lingering mm -hmm. where it was like, I'm not getting any younger, man. Like, I don't want to be that old dad at graduation. I know I mentioned this on like previous podcasts, but it still stands true. Um, and one thing that like made me want to be a dad was I had an awesome dad growing up. And mm -hmm. I can tell you from experience that Rick also had an incredible father growing mm -hmm. up. 
um matt i never met your dad so i, I assume he's a gg but but I mean, it was yeah, really just great, but right it's it's those experiences that you have with your father that you're like i i i think i can do this if i can if i can be one tenth the father that my dad was mm-hmm. then it's mission accomplished in my book and my dad's done some stupid shit all of our parents have done crazy things mm-hmm. right but at the end of the day they set us up for success because they cared about everything they told us to look both ways when we were 19 years old right right <laughs> yeah i mean that's definitely a thing like you know looking at stuff that you know i've got um older siblings who are parents um relative you know uncles aunts you know we all have done stuff that's immature that you're like yeah you know that person's a parent but then mm-hmm. you know at the actual act of being a parent um there's just some so many people knock it out of the park that Mm -hmm. that quells my anxiety about it because I think the majority of people are great parents and great dads and looking at, you know, my mother-in-law, my dad, my mother, you know, aunts and uncles, you know, grandparents too, like they did such a good job that I go, if I can just bottle a tiny bit of that, like you said, like one tenth of that, then I got nothing to worry about. I'm going to make it. We're ex- we're excited about the journey. I think is what yeah. No, I, it really boils boils down to we're excited to experience all that stuff that made our you know our father figures, our parents, and yeah. other parents in our lives such what we look at as such good parents is we're ready to kind of do that, follow those footsteps, and enjoy the process. To kind of go off this, you know, you look at that ability and you look at the, hey the one tenth of a father kind of thing that you know our parents, our fathers were and. You know, you look at some of those things where you're used to seeing somebody who's such a hard worker, that's such a provider who like no matter what, they'll make sure like not only dinner's on the table, but you can go to all those things. You can go to football or band or all this stuff and be part of this and still be there and, you know, cheering people on and everything. You know, you look at sometimes those really good things, but sometimes you also look at like the, hey, like when I get stressed out, what is my go to? And sometimes we'll fall in those roles of I'll just work harder kind of thing. It's like. Not a bad thing by any means. It's good to be a hard worker. It's good to, you know, be a provider. But we need to be so much more than that as a dad. Like we can't just be constantly just, you know, looking at that paycheck, hoping that to bring in more and that bringing in more will go ahead and to resolve some of those things. Because often bringing in more takes you further away from people. You know, it takes you out of those opportunities. So yeah, they can afford certain things. But the other side is like, what's really a need? What's a want? And what am I willing to miss out on here? Because you can find a way to make things work. It's not always, you know, grinding harder, so to speak, and trying to find out how to get more money in kind of thing. But, but that's my little yeah. suggestion there. Watch out. You know? Yeah. Well, no, it's yeah, great. It's... Awesome that you say that. Cause that's kind of like it really, it helped me figure out what we were trying to say is, you know, I don't know if the right word is idolizing our parents, but they always included us with what they were doing, which Matt's mm-hmm. trying to do a great job with that. He's taking his baby to everything he does. Drake concerts, mm-hmm. you know, crazy Cruise. stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I always, and I, to this day, the reason I want to have a relationship with my parents and hang out with them, and we mm-hmm. mentioned it before, like, sometimes you just want to drop everything and, you know, your parent calls and says, let's do this. You're like, yeah, cancel all my other plans. Is because mm-hmm. growing up, they, they included us with everything they did. You know, you you didn't live by the babysitter, you you know, in daycare, you were with them for everything. They, they dragged you along, kicking and screaming to everything. And it's, you know, I feel like that's molded me into who I am mm-hmm. is those, you know, core memories, those life moments where I was there with them. What are some of those things that kind of concern you? Because, you know, as we're putting out a parenting podcast, we hear that we're wrong a lot about a lot of things. Um, mm-hmm. I hear a lot about screen time. I hear a lot about baby buckets which are like the baby swings that i set my newborn in yeah i i hear about all these things but like what are some of those things that like are actually like should be a concern in your opinion Mm -hmm. um and some of the things that are kind of just like the flavor that you figured out just i mean you've had yeah five years of of trial and error with this like what are some things that you've personally figured out well and the thing is, a lot of the people don't want to say you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. It's either that, you know, you look at sometimes how consistent they are and maybe they've had so many kids and they feel like they truly know what's best kind of thing, you know. You say, okay, well, it's great that you have something that works for you and your family and your kids and fantastic. But I'm also wondering, you know, 
is that working for what age kid? Because you might see like things work really well for these younger ones. And then as these kids become teenagers, they start to completely resent their parents and everything. And it's like, well, maybe uh, somebody else had it a better way. Maybe along a little bit of screen time would have been maybe a, a better overall choice. You know, so there's always something that someone will go ahead and criticize over. So the idea isn't to get necessarily wrapped up in all these different, you know, things that you can possibly read through and all that stuff. Like they're all very important. I'm sure they all have a level of credibility and uh, value to them. Um, there's always more we can learn and that willingness to learn is that that thing that we'll, we'll continue to, to build on and to show like, hey, like those are the most important things, the willingness to take something into consideration and say, how can I apply it to my circumstance and situation? Because I hate to say it, guys, when it comes down to it, you know, if you're somebody who you're really kind of concrete in the way that you're thinking and some of the views that you have, chances are at some point your kid's going to rebel against that and you have to know who you are as a person if not, they're just going to railroad you. That's going to be it. Like, they're going to blindside you like no other. And then you're just going to be shocked and awed and trying to figure out how to respond to this. And if you don't have a good understanding of who you are, you will act out. You will rebel. You will also you know, start getting very boisterous and loud and try to threaten or take things away or all this stuff. And it's like, hey, kids are going to be defiant. They're going to rebel. They're going to, especially teenagers, you know, you are going to be met with a lot of conflict where you have to be willing to step back and say like, how am I seeing this? And what part of me is getting super upset over this? And how can I just give some time to really understand what's going on there um, rather than just reacting? So I guess, you know, all the disclaimers, anything's on anything medically, follow the medical opinions kind of thing. So if something says like, hey, don't sleep your child in this, don't sleep your child in this. There's a lot of scary things out there and do everything you possibly can um, to make sure that you're not, you know, just being completely negligent. You know, you want to make sure that you're present, you know, make sure that everything is baby safe, you know, have your plug covers in, have the sharp corners taken care of. Um, obviously you can't prepare for everything, but just that knowledge and that awareness of what could possibly wrong, what's the likelihood of something happening. Like you definitely want to be aware of those things. So I'm know. glad you say that. Cause we, we, we talk about this a lot on the podcast. We're a member of like the dad groups on Facebook and stuff like that. And there's so oh, much man. bad just throw the medical advice to the wind type advice from these people and it you and i see it a lot coming and it definitely comes from and you know mark synagogue commented on this too it's because a lot of the people in your life that you're listening to you know they were parents long before you were and you know their kids are older if they were your parents you're older and they kind of conflate at what time and stage in your life they did those things um and you you hear it all the time you know about parents that were parents in the 70s and 80s the co-sleeping thing was okay and all that stuff when it really wasn't because the information wasn't as readily available to figure out how bad it is and that's kind of one of the great things about this podcast is um we give a lot of people that are going through the early stages of parenthood you know a glimpse into what other people are doing at the same stage and i'm benefiting a lot from my personal life because like i said my brother and sister-in-law they have you know they just had you know they have one year old last week was his first birthday you know they have a two and a um four or five year old my name is four or five so and then my other close friends are all going through pregnancy or just you know just had kids at the same time that i am so i have all these other people to look at and see what they're doing what's working for them as long as it's safe obviously that i can apply now that i which really helps with my anxiety for it mm -hmm. Yeah, you have that common bond. Hmm. And speaking of those like parents who are like, oh, back in my day, I did this or whatever. And it was like, well, yeah, back in your day, you used to have to research by going to a library and looking at an encyclopedia. And if they didn't print a section on co-sleeping, I guess you just didn't know shit at that point. Um, that's where we have the internet, Grandma. Um, let me remind you of this. We have empirical quality, quantitative evidence that it's bad. Right. And the joys of the internet is also that you have all these horrible stories that are out there. So people truly think the world is so much more dangerous now than it ever was before. It's like, no, these things, I mean, people were abducted back in the day, believe it or not. There were abductions. There were big white vans that would drive around too and snatch your kids and everything too. So, you know, it's just one of those things. It, river. We, yeah, we get so, you know, caught up in like, oh, what could possibly have happened? What bad could happen? That we do start to helicopter parents, a parent, so to speak. Um, and the idea is like, okay, well, these things have always been going on. This isn't a new thing. So when you hear people like, we didn't have this in my day, it's like, yes, you did. I just, I just had just a general question, Rick. I mean, raising boys, I don't have that experience and having the ages of 
four and six, you said, correct? Yep. So you said six. they're yeah, rambunctious. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, could you just tell us like a quick anecdote of like one of those uh, what the fuck moments that you've experienced as a father uh, oh, raising man. two boys? P potty training was one. OK, so um, oh, one of the, the funny because I can remember like overflowing a toilet and like people being really mad at me for overflowing <laughs> a toilet. My son one time he's sitting today. there. And he turns around and he flushes once. And I didn't realize because, like, he's there on the toilet and stuff like that, too, when he's doing his other thing. So he flushes once. And I see he's still standing there. And I hear it flush again. I didn't think twice about it. And then all of a sudden, I hear it flushing. And the water just starts to like, cascade over the top. And he's just like, won't flush. Won't flush. He's, like, so distraught by it. And he's, like, just sitting there. He's standing there in, like, this panic. And just toilet water is just flowing over, like, everything in it and everything, too. And it's that moment of like, yes, it's upsetting, yes, it's anger provoking, but the other side is it's hilarious, you know, because it's <laughs> like he's looking at, it and yeah, of course, you know, it could have caused damage, you know, there could have been water damage and all this stuff, but like you just gotta laugh about that stuff, you know. They're young, they they make mistakes, they don't think about that. Like, it should flush, and when it doesn't, naturally think flush again. I, you know what I mean? I can't tell you how many times that I give it that second flush just to hope that it might dislodge it. And I'm like, uh oh, I got to do something before I ruin my house. And I'm 30. So <laughs> in my 30s, child. The other potty training one, too, has to do with, um, you know, when they first learn and they're, they're even further along kind of thing and they're having accidents. Sometimes, like, what, you can't break away for a second from doing this just to go potty and, like, poop in the potty kind of thing? It's like, wait, if I had the choice of, like, not having to, like, leave the Lions game and just taking a dump right there, like, I think I might take that. Like, that sounds like an appealing option to me. Just saying, like, maybe they should just, you know, like, those little barf bags that they have on airplanes, like, do the same thing under the seats at the Lions games. Hope for the best and see what happens. No one's gonna be that offended. It's Detroit. Come on now, you know. <laughs> Gotta invent the recliner toilet. <laughs> Why'd I wear this fucking shirt? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong about Detroit. I'm just saying, like, sometimes you get like that sewery smell. Everyone knows the smell of Detroit. It's, it's, I, they should sell it in a candle. People go, that's Detroit. Anyway, sorry. Wow. <laughs> oh man, we're gonna get so much hate from <laughs> Detroiters. <laughs> It's our, it's our target demographic over here is uh, uh, the Detroit dads. Just to kind of cut to the chase, one thing we love to talk about on the podcast is like dad gadgets, parent gadgets. Um, not to plug it, but we are now sponsored by Baby Reza. We're going to have a little commercial in there for you. Um, but we love the gadgets. Um, some are useless. We do talk about the wagons. Um, we're not uh, totally on board with the Rolls Royce wagon uh, mm -hmm. phenomenon that's going on. But as you become a dad, um, we talk a lot about the baby gadgets, but now that, you know, we're talking to somebody who's got a, you know, five and a four year old, what are some of the gadgets you just cannot live without that your kids have to have that you have to have to get through the day? And what are some of the other ones that you just shake your head at that you don't know why you bought? Um, yeah, I, the, the, those boppy pillows to start, you know, those kind of things like those are always like great for mom kind of thing, but they're also great to like, just like pop your hand up kind of thing and have the little one kind of lay in there. You know, it's nice. Cause then you have to keep like do, doing the bicep, like monstrous kind of bicep after a while oh, yeah. you'll notice one side of your body and the mouse probably notices too. One side of your body will be completely like defined and like jacked. And the other <laughs> side will just be totally useless. And it's like, Hey, this is you're holding the baby. Right. Exactly. <laughs> So the quagmire kind of, you know, like, <laughs> look at the map, anyway. <laughs> Good reference. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, there's nothing that's really like, make or break. Right now, my kids are going through the stage of like Transformers and everything and like Street Sharks and like Ninja Turtles and all that stuff. So like the 90s are coming back and I'm like, this is, I pulled out all my old toys that I had because I'm a hoarder and we have to throw anything away. Um, I pulled them all out and they're like having a blast with them. Of course, they'd probably, you know, be... Um, not safe for kids now because there's some piece that could fall off for this or that, but you know, um, oh no, they're having a blast with those. Um, so the, the toys are great. Um, as for anything that was useless, I don't think anything is truly useless. I, I do like the, the baby cams because you can kind of use them not only like watch the kids initially at night, but also when they get a little bit older, like you can put them in the living room. So if you guys ever want to sneak off real quick and you're like, hey, like we got to keep an eye on these kids, but we also have to like, you know, get some time for ourselves kind of thing. You can go ahead and pop that bad boy on and just have it kind of facing and be like, okay, as long as we can see them and they're being monitored, we're good. Like, Let them know your, to your life is going to be amazing. Anyway, like, we got to get back to things, you know, but yeah. <laughs> it's awesome that you mentioned like having your old toy. I'm not a hoarder, so I don't like have any 
my parents probably have like all my old stuff, but I never think about it. Like I don't have it at my house. If it does exist, you know, it does. I'm not, cause I'm not a hoarder. I'm a, if I don't see something in a year and I find it and I don't need it, I I'm getting rid of it. I don't like to keep stuff around, but a core memory I have is, you know, my dad busting out his battleship game or his game of risk. Like I probably was like 11, 12, 13, 14 at the time. Cause these have swallable mm-hmm. parts, which mm-hmm. at that age probably wasn't safe for me either. Uh, but like, that was like so cool. I'm like, Oh, this is dad stuff that he played with. Mm-hmm. You know, that's actually cool that you have all that stuff. Now I want to, you know, raid my parents' house and start grabbing stuff. I'm telling you, man, just start indoctrinating them, right? Get them into, like you said, street sharks, <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. If you already got the stuff there, like, let's make the fan. Gargoyles movies coming out. They're going to do Gargoyles. The Nerf stuff right now is ridiculous. I mean, it's, uh, and I got to watch what I say, but some of those, uh, some of the Nerf stuff, you just look, they have like scopes that go on and they break off and clips and everything. It's like, they should just teach them how to use the safety and everything would be good. Like, why not? Like, (laughs) just push this button and everything is fine. It's like, what like i picked up a nerf gun i'm like how, this has to be like a 70 dollar gun it was like 12 dollars, and i was like no way like they're just giving these things away to kids for the most part and it's just like you know automatic battery power you start holding one trigger you hear it going like the gatling gun like go 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 go, go. it's like man like where was but that yeah that's not cool. yeah exactly we had the little like pull and shoot kind of thing of, haha so much fun like these kids are like to this next level and transformers the same way you go, you like, you set them up, you hit them once, and they transform by themselves. And it's like, no way, like, you, no, like, wait one second. You know, right. trying to get it all, you know, together. But yeah, it's awesome. But don't good. ever understand the struggles. I mean, no. when we were when we were, you know, not that age, a little bit older. You know, we were shooting each other with airsoft guns, mm-hmm. and we thought that was cool, mm-hmm. right? Like, you mean like in college? Mm-hmm. No, I mean like, I mean, no. that, like high school. You mean like three weeks ago? <laughs> Yeah, I got a couple got a couple of welts over here, bud. What Bring have you found head. is the most important thing to remember when you, like personally, not like I I guess try and keep a little bit of your professional training out of this that if you found is like the most important thing to remember when when you're trying to be a good dad to your boys. Hmm. That they are not adults, they are children and they will make horrible mistakes they will do things without thinking and that first impulse sometimes is to get really mad and stuff like that and that ability just to take a second and to remind yourself that they're you know four three two one a couple months old um you just see how you you know you see how we forget that we're working with kids that are not they're not adults, you know, they, they are children. And you get so upset sometimes. It's like, wait, how, how is it that they're conceptualizing? The, how are they seeing the world? What's going on? And then some of those memories that do imprint on you that you remember sometimes, like, I can remember my dad being really mad at me doing this. And it's like, you don't want to be feeding into those memories. So just, you know, take a minute, take a step back. If you have to go scream on the other side of the house, like, go ahead and do so. But come back just like grounded and together and like just knowing like, hey, like, I don't want to do anything to possibly traumatize my kids. So that would be, you know, keep it in mind. Great answer. Especially because as I was asking that question, when I, when I wrote that question down earlier Mm -hmm. today, it sounded great in my head. And then as I was speaking, I'm like, this is going to be a terrible question. And then you just, you made it a good question by giving such a good answer. I mean, this, this podcast has just been full of so many nuggets that wherever you're at on your dad journey, or just in your relationships with your spouse, like you'll be able to listen to this and learn something. And Rick, we can't thank you enough for joining us today on Dad Brain. If you want to do any plugs, this would be the place to do so. No, I mean, um, I'm not going to plug a business or anything like that. If anyone has any follow-ups, you can go ahead and email me at insightfulinflux at uh, yahoo.com. Um, professional email kind of thing, uh, real professional email there kind of thing. But I'll go ahead and I'll respond however if I can. Um, if you're local and you're able to to possibly, you know, look me up possibly, if you want to go ahead and send me inf- my information, that is an alias. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll put you in the direction of some local resources possibly or those things. But know that you're not alone. Know that you have plenty of people out there that are willing to sit and listen with you. The fact that you're listening in right now is saying something about you. You're already going leaps and bounds beyond the next guy who's just sitting there eating cheesecake and not thinking twice about his kids. Um, so uh, g- great overall you know, ability to be here and uh, really just work on yourself. So keep working on yourself and 
no no other plugs than that just you know um i'm not a gadget thing you know and then just uh to really clarify it um, a little cya if you could give us you know a really good disclaimer um to remember that this is not medical advice this is not professional help this is a podcast Mm -hmm. if you want to go ahead and do put your jargon into it do whatever you got to do well that's exactly it is that this is not intended to be any kind of medical advice or any kind of um like you know the idea if you need therapy go see a therapist if you're truly struggling with things if you are depressed if you're anxious if you're having a hard time go sit down talk to somebody um don't use this as like the hey you know i I heard this on a podcast so it has to be the end all be all kind of thing like go sit down keep working on yourself but don't don't use this podcasts are great podcasts offer a wealth of knowledge there are a lot of really bad podcasts out there um this i don't think is one of them by any means um but yeah you, you just see like people using podcasts as like their their evidence to you know even people coming on saying like oh yeah you guys are saying everything wrong it's like this is just a couple of dads talking about life and those kind of things and providing support to one another. Like this is the equivalent of sitting inside, around inside a coffee shop, just having a good time, inviting people over to say, Hey, have coffee and sit around. Let's talk. So, um, so yeah, my disclaimer turned into a little jargon, kind of little, um, jargon, little journey off the side kind of thing, but, um, it's absolutely awesome. Rick, <laughs> once again, we can't thank you enough for being with us today on dad brain. Thanks for listening to another episode of Dad Brain. New episodes come out every Sunday. Don't miss any. Subscribe today wherever you listen to podcasts. While you are there, help spread the word about Dad Brain by leaving a rating and review. Can't get enough Dad Brain? Follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Dad Brain Pod.